Thank you for that lovely song, Pat. And I, I know that one always gives me all the feels and maybe it does for uh, some of you too. I wanna to say a special welcome to any of you who might be joining us for the first time on Zoom today. Uh, you know, we're all learning new things and um, finding new places and new ways of being in this time. And I am grateful for every single face that I see here and the, the names that light up and the phone numbers and all of you finding ways to come and connect. This is the third Sunday of Easter and we are coming to celebrate the God who is revealed in our homes in ordinary times like the breaking of the bread. So thank you for breaking bread with us today. I want to say um, to those of you who are anxiously thinking about when and how will we convene as an in-person church, I know that's sort of in the air right now, um, I want you to know that you're not alone. Uh, Gary, the council president, and I have started talking about how we can convene um, a group of people to help plan about different possibilities. You know, as you know, this pandemic and our scientific understanding of it change daily, sometimes hourly. <laughs> um, so we're trying to be very flexible in how we create plans, but we also don't want to be caught unawares if possible. Um, so we are working on that. And if that's the kind of creative thinking that really uh, gets you jazzed up, um, let me know and uh, we will connect with you as we have that conversation. And if you're someone who would rather just say, tell me what to do and I'll do it, that is totally fine too. <laughs> so, um, but I want you to know that we're thinking about it and we're working on it. Um, we don't yet have a plan to announce, but we are working on it. I think that uh, it's important to say, you know, we've, we've proven now that the church is not a building and we can continue to be in relationship with one another uh, in new ways. And it's okay to grieve and to miss the old things, but also okay to get excited about the new possibilities. We are starting a new worship series this week and you may see that I'm in a slightly different place. Um, this one is about being connected to Christ in our homes. And we've invited you all to have a snack or breakfast or brunch with us. Uh, maybe we'll see some avocado toast on your plates, I don't know. Uh, and, uh, you know, a beverage of choice. And two things that will come into play in our worship today are a candle and a worry stone. Um, and that can be anything that you can kind of worry with your hands like this. Um, and if you don't have it today, that's okay. And if you need one, we have a lot from our wilderness display. So uh, we would be happy to help you find one <laughs> if, you, if you need that. So we're gonna be engaging at our tables. And so I decided that the way to do worship with you was to have a table with the disciples. Um, so here we are with our, uh, our church altar, but in a slightly different way. We are at table with the disciples. And so I hope that uh, is meaningful and helpful for you in some way. This worship series is designed around uh, Acts 2 verses 46 through 47. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. So we're gonna do our worship in some phases. We're gonna spend time together like the disciples did, and that, that will be our call to worship, our opening prayer, our concerns of the church. We're going to break bread, and next week it will be full-on communion like we uh, are used to, but this week it's just whatever you got around. Um, we're sharing with one another in this virtual way. It will also be the way that we break open the scriptures and have a discussion. That will be the sermon time. And on our Facebook page, um, if you are able to do two screens at once, which is, uh, you know, the next level, really, um, you might want to add on to the discussion questions. But don't worry about it if you don't, it, that's there. You can add to it later too. Um, and then we will uh, have goodwill um, and that will be sort of how we take our worship into the world um, and our benediction. And then they add on this praise God. And we know that as the closing prayer and the closing hymn, which we will do. But there's also an invitation to a dance party. 
Um, and so after our uh, closing traditional hymn, our postlude will be a pop song um, that you are encouraged to dance to. You can turn your video off if you want. Uh, but we want to get you moving, get those endorphins going um, so that we're not always just sitting in worship, but actually moving too. So I hope that's fun. Um, and if it's not, you know, you, it's the end of the service, so you can turn it off. <laughs> Uh, we do have fun pictures for you though during that time so you may want to stay on and at least try it out let's see i think that's it for basic instructions and whether you're here because you followed an internet link and thought eh, why not or because you long to connect those with those that you miss or because christ is at the heart of it all for you and you are ready to worship you are welcome here no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey you are welcome here. We have some special celebrations today. Um, it's important anniversaries for David and Sandra and Bob and Joyce. And it's also the birthday of the Orchid Lady, who Samantha is representing here. Uh, so Gwen is uh, celebrating a, a birthday that we want to celebrate. Um, and so we are going to sing happy birthday to Gwen. Love you, Gwen, and hope that you're having a wonderful birthday. We're going to spend some time in the temple, and we are reminded that the temple exists uh, in lots of ways. And, uh, and right now, the temple is at your home, um, but we're also right here, too. So I would invite you to join me in prayer, and this is a prayer that has a motion to it, a hand to your heart. So we continue with our Easter season because Easter isn't just one day. It is the message of God's desire for us to live fully every day. The church practiced their hope in this way, day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. So we create a temple of worship in our hearts that connects us across boundaries and distance and time. But as we share this worship, we will, uh, we will find ways to be connected to the spirit, which is the heart of all worship. So we're gonna center ourselves and center our hearts to begin. Take a deep breath together. I invite you to place your hand on your heart and quiet yourself enough that you can feel your heart beat. You can even tap along if you like. Holy living God, heartbeat of creation, help us to take this time to center on you. For you made us, you gave us life, and you continue to be with us in every moment, every breath, every step. Hear this assurance from God. Be still, O oh heart, you're not alone. Your beat is shared with me. Come now and call and center here. Your mind secure and free.
Let's take another deep breath, making sure our shoulders and any tension we feel in our bodies is letting go with that breath. Take another one. If you have it with you, pick up your heart stone or your worry stone. Touch its surface to remind us that God's touch is within us and between us and around us. As close and real as this object is in our hearts now is how close love is to us always. Let us imagine letting go of our worries for now into for now into God's heart of love. You can put it by your candle. We offer a song of letting go. Into your care we offer now our worries, fears, and strife. We turn to you and oh, you're near. Your light, our love and life. If you haven't lit your candle now, I already did. <laughs> you can put your worry stone next to it and light it. For God is with us and we can set our worries at the base of God's love. Hey kids, so we have a pretty cool story today that the disciples were a little lost in their own sadness. It happens when you're sad. You don't pay attention and you're really just paying attention to yourself. Well, they were walking along and they met this guy and they started talking to him and they didn't realize it was Jesus, which seems crazy that you wouldn't recognize one of your best friends. Could you imagine walking along and not, mad, like not realizing it was one of your best friends walking next to you? That seems crazy, right? Like, it's, they were just, I don't know what they were doing. But all of a sudden, when Jesus did something, they realized who it was. He broke bread. He ate with them. He had a snack with them. So I know there are things that we do that show love. And it's something that we do, and it's our thing. It's when... Isabella roars at me instead of saying hello. It seems bizarre, but it's her way of saying that she loves me. And I'm okay with that. And I roar back at her. And then she now sneezes everywhere around the house too. So it's funny. But there are also things that we do when we're together and we give each other hugs and high fives and, and we, we run around with each other and we play and we can't do that right now. So I have a fun way, and this is for all the kids. I don't care if you're two or 102. You all can do this too. So it's a way to send a hug. So I made, oh, I think I have to take off my background. Hold on. This is what happens sometimes when you don't think things through. Okay, <laughs> so I made this big heart. Huh? These are longer than my arms because I have short arms. But it's a big hug. And I got hands over here and over here. And when I fold it all up, I can put it in the mailbox and I can mail it to any one of you all. Or to someone in the nursing home, someone that lives by themselves and doesn't see a whole lot of people. So what I'm going to ask you to do is make a paper hug and send it to somebody. Send it to grandma and grandpa that you haven't seen in a while. Send it to your aunts, your uncles, your best friends in church. I don't care who you send it to. Anybody. To let them know that you love them and that if you were with them, you would give them a big old hug. And that's how we can show our love with each other since we can't be with each other physically. Can you all, make, can you all do this? You all can make it, right? 
I know you're going to make it. And it's okay. Make your arms long and ears. It's totally fine. I did. I added like a foot to my height with this. This is the only thing I can do to taller kids. Yeah. Big, Maddie, right. big, big, big hands and arms to give around everybody in the family. That's, that's perfect. I love it. It's like a big virtual hug, right? So everybody give a big virtual hug. Everybody, big arms. Big arms. Yes, please. Because we miss each other. That was perfect. Okay, I want everybody to fill the mailboxes up with lots of hugs this week, okay? Thank you all. And maybe just to be safe, if you have a can of Lysol, spray it down. <laughs> yeah. Next, we come to the time of breaking the bread, that time when Jesus is known to us. And we're going to share a story today about another meal that Jesus attended. And because it happened in an unexpected way, listen for how people didn't recognize him at first. It took sitting down to the table for people to realize that Christ was with them still. Every time we gather around a table, we can recognize that Christ is with us. Eat inside each one of us every time we love each other by sharing food together. I'm going to invite you to say a, a prayer with me that blesses this food or the food that you'll have for lunch or uh, any other holy meal that you will have. And it's a repeat after me, so I'm just going to, you're muted, so you can say it as loudly or as softly as you want. Um, but uh, I will give time for prayer. Holy and surprising God, we gather in your name, invited by Jesus, bound together with your spirit, in union with each other. Feed our bodies and our spirits with your comforting presence so that we might be your comfort to others. Bless this food. Break open our hearts. Bless this drink and pour out your love. Amen. Now I invite you, if you have food with you, to pick it up, if it's pickupable, or pick up the vessel that it's in. And let us say the one word that is at the heart of the matter in every blessing we do at our table. So repeat after me, grateful. And let us begin to break bread while we break open the word in our scriptures. And I will also offer you a pro tip for next week. Did you know that if you order a dozen glazed donuts at Krispy Kreme, they'll give you another glazed dozen for free on Saturdays? Just say and I'll see you in the drive through line next week. Okay, I'm going to read our scripture this week, but I want to offer an invitation. If one of you would be interested in reading the scripture for next week and recording it ahead of time, we can play it as a video so you can do it from a distance. Uh, so we would love to have some different voices uh, up here. I, I imagine y'all might get tired of me talking all the time. Um, so if that's something you'd be willing to do, we'd love for you to do it. But here is the story of Jesus' surprise visit on the road and at the dinner, and the dinner that happened. Imagine yourself walking down the road and a stranger comes along. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that happened. And while they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place here over the last few days? He said to them, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, 
Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he's alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had said. They didn't see him. And Jesus said to them, you foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going all through the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, stay with us. It's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But he disappeared from their sight. And they said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? They got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, the Lord really has risen. <laughs> he appeared to Simon. Then the two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. After Christ was no longer with his disciples in the flesh, several letters began to circulate, making the rounds to the early Christian communities. This one is from a letter called 1 Peter that is recorded in our New Testament. It reminds us that the story of Jesus is about new birth for all people, and we are to be seeds of God's life-giving love. Christ was chosen before the creation of the world, but was only revealed at the end of time. This was done for you, who through Christ are faithful to the God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. So now your faith and hope should rest in God. As you set yourselves apart by your obedience to the truth so that you might have genuine affection for your fellow believers, love each other deeply, and earnestly do this because you have been given new birth not from the type of seed that decays but from the seed that doesn't this seed is god's life-giving and enduring word these are the words of god for the people of god this day jesus's table ministry was a preeminent way that he showed and shared a depth of love unseen in his time he ate and spent time with those considered unworthy of his attention. Even in his post-resurrection appearances, it was in the breaking of the bread that he was recognized. Perhaps because so many times in his ministry, it was at the tables that he invited people to open up and share straight from the heart, getting right to the heart of the matter. As we gather this day, we remember that at the heart, his message was unconditional love. To offer ourselves straight from the heart is the seed that he planted in us. And this is the growth we must continue to nurture. As we think about these scriptures, and we pray that God breaks them open for us and illumines them for us, it's important to remember that this was still Easter day. I mean, we're three weeks after our celebration, but, you know, long before COVID, people had a little confusion about what day it was, right? And the lectionary recognizes this, that, that something about this time of grief and confusion can just stretch time. 
in unusual ways. And so our reading today is yet another way that we look at the Easter day. And it's people who are grieving. It's people who are lost and in confusion. It's people who don't know what to do now that their world has been put into chaos. I wonder if that sounds familiar to any of us. The passage from 1 Peter uses this image of planting seeds of love. The boys and Les and I have started a garden uh, during this quarantine time, and we have had all sorts of exciting adventures attempting to put together a few raised beds. And yesterday, we tried planting some seeds, and I was so excited about how perfect it was all going to be. And... Um, you know, we got together, we had these really lovely boxes that Les built, and we had seeds ready to go, and I had poked holes, you know, exactly where they should go. And I gave each boy a seed for them to drop in the hole and pointed to the hole and made it all perfect. And of course, they threw the seeds all over the place and then threw the dirt all over the place. <laughs> and it was all mass chaos. But you know... I suspect there are still gonna be plants that grow in those boxes. They may not be exactly in the places they are. They may need a little work. They may need a little transplanting. They may need a little pruning in order to be able to work together. They may need some thinning. Uh, and some may even be out of the box. But there are seeds planted as an act of faith. And the boys also showed me some other things because as I was busy thinking about the appropriate places for plants and spacing and all of that, they were turning over pots that were upside down in the garden, looking for worms and roly polies, looking for new, weird, squishy life that was found underneath. And they brought the worms to our garden to nurture the soil. And worms, of course, are a rather disgusting but important symbol of the ways that, uh, that nature makes new life and fertilization out of garbage. And I'm struck by the way that they taught me to look for that new life in the midst of my well-planned garden that they were planting seeds of love, even as I was trying to plant seeds of beans and peppers. In the story of the walk to Emmaus, we have two people who are grieving, for whom time no longer has meaning and for whom pretty much everything they knew no longer has meaning. They are scared, they are in danger, because they belong to a sect that is seriously persecuted and their leader was just killed. And they really can't fathom the grace that is being offered. And you can read this passage in a very sort of judgy way. You know, Jesus is like, you fools, how could you not know this? You know, you could read it that way. But I almost imagine the way that a parent says to a child, <laughs> Silly. Aren't you sweet? You don't even know. You don't yet even know what is yet to be broken open. Even though I've told you 500 times, you can't process it yet. And that's okay. I'm going to keep doing the things that teach you grace and love until you get it. These disciples were blind to the ability to see that love and that grace. And it wasn't until they acted out the love together that they did those rituals that were meaningful to them, they broke bread, that they knew that things were maybe not as despairing as they had thought. We are in a time where many of us are in grief or despair or confusion, 
It's something that the theologian Richard Rohr names as liminal space. He says it's an inner state and sometimes an outer situation where we can begin to think and act in new ways. It's where we are betwixt and between, having left one room or stage of life, but not yet entering the next. It's a threshold moment. We usually enter liminal space when our former way of being challenged, or former way of being is challenged or changed, he says. Perhaps when we lose a job or a loved one, during illness, at the birth of a child or a major relocation, he says, it is a graced time, but often does not feel graced in any way. In such space, we are not certain or in control. And this global pandemic we now face is an example of immense collective liminal space. The very vulnerability and openness of liminal space allows room for something genuinely new to happen. We are empty and receptive erased tablets waiting for new words. Liminal space is where we are most teachable, often because we are most humbled, like worms in the dirt. It's no surprise then that we generally avoid liminal space. Much of the work of authentic spirituality and human development is to get people in to liminal space and keep them there long enough that they can learn something essential and new. I wonder if some of you remember that from major spiritual moments in your own life. Rohr says this in-between place is free of illusions and false payoffs. It invites us to discover and live from broader perspectives and with much deeper seeing. In liminal space, we sometimes need to not do and not perform according to our usual successful patterns. We actually need to fail abruptly and deliberately falter to understand other dimensions of life. We need to be silent instead of speaking, experience emptiness instead of fullness, anonymity instead of persona, and pennilessness instead of plenty. In liminal space, we descend and intentionally do not come back out or up immediately. It takes time, but this experience can help us recenter the world with freedom and new creative approaches to life. I imagine that even if you haven't ever even heard of the word liminal before, you likely have a sense of what I'm talking about, he says. It would be difficult to exist in this time of global crisis and not feel caught between at least two worlds, the one we knew before and the one that is to come. Our consciousness of that future generation has been changed. We cannot put the genie back in the bottle. Roar ends his wisdom there, <laughs> no answers, because it is a liminal space. We are walking on that road. We don't even know who's walking with us, but we reach out to companions, offer them hospitality and love and trust that Jesus is in there somewhere, that Christ is in that mix Christ is in the dirt already, helping to germinate new life. So in the midst of grief and despair in this new quarantined world, there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot to grieve and fear. And we might be spending all of our time talking about it, the way the disciples were on the road. I think I've not seen a news story that doesn't involve the coronavirus in months, <laughs> or a month at least. In the midst of this grief and this processing, let's remain open to the possibility that some of what we don't know yet could be good news, could be life and love in a new way. And if we continue to welcome and share and find creative ways to do ministry together, Jesus will show. 
We may be blind, but we will see. Our worship series has in it an action response. That's a way that you can physically respond to the service. And so I invite you, if you would, to put both hands on your heart and close your eyes for just a moment and think about a message of love that you would want to share. If you are with others and in reaching distance, you could reach out and connect your hands with those who are with you around or across the table. If you are alone, reach out your hands to your sides and imagine two people on either side of you to whom you would want to offer love right now. You can reach out to them by text or self or call later to let them know you were thinking of them at this moment. You could write them a letter even. You could send them a heart. In this moment, we just let this gesture plant more seeds of love straight from the heart. And in doing so, we ground ourselves more in the heart center of Christ. I offered on Facebook a little prompt, uh, and some of you may have responded to it since uh, I last looked, so I'm going to look up and see. But there is a complete the sentence activity, and this week it is, as you, um, it is, I see love shared in, when, or where, fill in the blank. And here are some of the responses that I have seen. Brian says, I see love shared when we Zoom together. From Judy, I see love shared every day and communications from loved ones, church friends, neighbors, and classmates from 54 years ago. They are my earthly angels. Buzz says, I see love every time family, friends, or neighbors bring groceries to the door and every day when a big afternoon meal is placed on the table. Samantha says, when youth, when youth sewed masks, when they color pictures or make cards and call church members, print 3D ear savers, help their parents clean, make treats to share with loved ones and share affirmations which, with another during a virtual retreat like they had this weekend. Kelly says, when we have drive-by birthday parades. Janice says, friends daily at work that are in the same situations together. And at IUCC, when we are able to name whose names we do not even know, but we know that they need our prayers and God's comfort. For those who've lost loved ones, for those who are sick and recovering, for those who are caring for loved ones who are sick at home, for those who are caring for persons in medical care, for those who are separated from loved ones, for those who are feeling alone and isolated, for those who are helping and so very tired, for those who are struggling to find friends, food, and comfort, for those who are afraid. For parents, siblings, niece and nephew. That's a prayer concern from Les, but many others might have similar prayers. And for those who are having joy in the midst, we offer our love. I see that Don has said that his father had his 90th birthday yesterday. We give thanks for the ways that they were able to connect in this strange time. Let us pray. Oh, one more. Two more. Oh, the prayers are coming in. For Linda's sister, Bonnie, in great pain and alone. And for Grandma Goebel, who has fallen and broke her face and hip in the last two days. Oh, may she find God's comfort. Let us pray. Elusive God, companion on the way, you walk behind, beside, and beyond. You catch us unaware. 
break through the disillusionment and despair clouding our vision that with wide-eyed wonder we may find our way and journey on as messengers of your good news. Show up in the rooms of those who need you now, those who are grieving, in despair, struggling, or sick. Offer them peace. Be known to them as they break bread. Breathe into them the breath of life. Sustain all of us, God, as we seek to follow you. This we pray in the name of that mysterious Savior, present even when we think we are truly alone, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. After the breaking of the bread, they praised God and had good will toward all. And so it seems appropriate that this is the time that we come to our call to offering. You know, this was the time that we used to pass the plates and share all of our germs, which we didn't even think about, but also share of our resources and our gifts. If you are able to share financially, we do need that in order to be able to continue as a church. And so we give you thanks for the ways that you are continuing to share. But also, we are sharing in so many ways and this time of offering is a time to bless all of those to bless the goodwill that we talked about to bless all those ways that we see jesus among us and our ability to participate in that often we don't see what gifts we have to offer just like the disciples on that road and so we pray that god helps us see what we can give and helps us give it with generous and glad hearts this worship series offers you a chance to have goodwill with some tangible ways. And the heart activity that, uh, that Samantha described is the way for this week that we encourage you to do. But maybe you have another way too that you've thought of to share with other people that message of Christ that they are not alone. That God is there. That God loves them straight from the heart. However you choose to do it, I hope you will find some way to give this week because it is in giving and receiving that our hearts are broken open. Friends, I'm going to offer you a benediction and then we shall sing together and maybe even dance together. As we close our time together, remember, God is always with you. No matter what you face, no matter what trials or hardships come your way, God is right beside you, offering love straight from the heart, guiding and directing your path. So acknowledge your fear and your worry and know it is as true and holy as any feeling, including joy and hope and love. Take heart. This is the heart of the matter. Amen. Be in peace. Thank you.
I've been dreaming.